technology in a changing ocean. Um, okay, so. Okay, so first of all, the overview of my talk is it's a research seminar, so I want to document uh, this research that I've been doing over the previous eight years. And I want to show you this uh, ecophysiology model that I've developed. It's called the Absolute Metabolic Index, or uh, FI with a A underneath it. Um, but it's, I understand that this is a broad audience and it's a pretty complex thing. So I thought that the best way to showcase the development of this model was to highlight three research, four research studies in um, increasing complex complexness over time. Um, and that will hopefully show you how I've the thought process towards developing this model. Um, so I'm going to try and present this thing in a narrative. Um, it's going to go through the research studies that I've done. Um, and also serve as an introduction to my specific research field to my colleagues. Um, I just want to start off by making a disclaimer that fish physiology is an extremely niche field. There's a lot of uh, technical jargon. Um, so please, if you don't understand anything, just ask a question and interrupt me. And I'm going to try to keep it really high level um, and just dust over a couple of key concepts. Okay, so my sort of uh, foray into fish physiology all started uh, when I began my PhD. So at the time I was uh, living in Mexico and I just ran out of money. And the day I ran out of money, I got a call from Warren Potts at Rhodes University asking me if I'd like to come back to Grahamstown, South Africa and do a PhD. So he had just received a big grant from the National Research Foundation, and it was to set up the first ecophysiology research platform in Africa. Um, and I sort of jumped at this opportunity because one of the things that he offered me was complete autonomy of my PhD, as long as it's within the broader scope of uh, ecophysiology discipline. So I had this perfect opportunity to move back to South Africa and begin this PhD. So I jumped on the, sold my car and bought a ticket and jumped on the plane back to uh, South Africa. And then I started reading for a PhD at Rhodes University in ecophysiology. And so this is the kind of stuff that I was reading about, right? So I was reading about uh, climate change in the ocean. Some of the biggest things that were going on was that the ocean was warming and it was losing oxygen. There were marine heat waves, um, hypoxic events, general warming and the general decrease in oxygen availability. Um, and we're at a point in time then in about 2015 when there was really an increase in the documents of these, this effect of climate change in the ocean on marine organisms. So one of the main things people started realizing was that organisms were changing size, they were shrinking, fish were shrinking in the ocean, um, and distributions were changing. So generally, organisms were moving their core distribution away from the equator towards previously cooler water that was now inhabitable. Um, but what I just want to highlight with these two case studies is that the direction and magnitude of these body size changes and distribution shifts were extremely variable. Some organisms, for some reason, moved towards the equator where it was hotter, and some organisms actually got bigger. Um, so there was no consistent pattern, uh, and this made any sort of adaptive management to mitigate the impacts of climate change on these species kind of challenging. Um, so the field of conservation physiology or ecophysiology really had their moment to shine. Um, and that's because it promised that it was a study of the understanding of the physiology driving the ecological pattern that we're seeing, right? The shifting distributions or the changing in body size, or the changing of uh, timing of events and things like that. And this paper came out in 2006, titled Cons Conservation Physiology, which was the first time it was like documented officially in the marine ecology literature. Um, and then in 2013, just before I started my PhD, this paper came out in a new journal that had just sprung up called Conservation Physiology, which is specifically focused at this new emerging discipline. Okay. So the process works like this, is that most marine organisms are ectotherms. That means that uh, the temperature of their body and their physio physiological rates is driven by the environmental temperature. It's vital for 
uh, organisms to maintain optimal physiological function, right? So they'll always seek environments where their physiologies are optimized. Um, so if you take an organism in a lab and you quantify how its physiology changes with environmental conditions, you can use this as a gauge to forecast the direction and magnitude of likely climate change effects on a species. So that was the promise of conservation physiology. And then I just want to dive into a little bit deeper, which is just a key concept to understand for the rest of this talk, is this idea of aerobic metabolism and aerobic metabolic scope. Okay, so aerobic metabolism is the sum of all the energy manipulating processes that happen inside an organism. And it's essentially the energy that fuels life. Okay, so if you grow, if you move, you're using your aerobic metabolism. Okay, and it's also because all these organisms are ectotherms, it's the rate of aerobic metabolism is driven by temperature and oxygen. Okay, so you've got these two key baseline metabolic levels. Your standard metabolic rate at the bottom, which is the energy you're using just to stay alive. So if you're sitting on a couch, just watching TV, not exerting yourself, you're operating at your basal metabolism, your standard metabolic rate. And then you have something called a maximum metabolic rate, which is the most amount of energy you can manipulate at any given time. Okay, so these are two limits in your metabolism. And in between these levels, you can partition energy to growth, you can partition energy or metabolism to digestion and to activity. Okay. So the difference between your maximum rate of metabolism and your basal rate of metabolism, which you need just to stay alive, we call your aerobic budget or your aerobic scope. Okay. So it's a simple equation. Aerobic scope equals maximum metabolic rate minus standard metabolic rate. Okay. So if you measure this across temperatures, you get something like this, which is an aerobic budget curve. Okay. So you can clearly see that if a higher aerobic budget is better, there's a temperature where your aerobic metabolism is maximized. And we hypothesize in conservation physiology that that's the optimal temperature for an organism. So once you've calibrated this curve for a particular species, you can start asking questions like, if the temperature moves from that red dot towards its optimal temperature, things might get better for that organism. Or if it moves from that red, second red dot towards a warmer temperature, things might get worse, and maybe this organism will now leave that area or change its body size. So this is a sort of predictive framework that we're using. Yeah. So moving on, so that's just background to the fundamentals of this research. So my first research study I want to highlight was when I started my PhD. Was So some background is that in terms of climate resilience, it's hypothesized that a higher aerobic scope or aerobic budget is believed to confer climate resilience to an organism. Okay, so there's a graph of two aerobic scope curves. And let's just say that your threshold level to maintain, to persist in the area has to be just above three. If you have a low aerobic scope curve, like the orange line, you can occupy temperatures between those two stars. Whereas if you have a higher aerobic scope curve, you can occupy a broader temperature range, and thus you potentially less affected by whatever thermal change is happening in that particular region. Yeah. So that was the idea. A higher aerobic scope is better for climate resilience. And then there's also a proliferation of research on marine protected areas, positing, positing that marine protected areas confer climate resilience to organisms that reside within the, their boundaries, right? So you often hear that, okay, we're in a climate change hotspot. How do we mitigate the effects of climate change on fish populations? Let's put a marine reserve there. Okay. So I wanted to pair these two concepts and then ask the question is, do MPAs harbor physiological resilience of organisms and inhabit them? Okay. So to do that, I made use of a model species in South Africa, Roman sea bream. It's similar, but not that similar to bourgeois. Um, and we took advantage of a model study site. Okay, so in South Africa, you have the Tsitsikama Marine Protected Area, which is the longest standing marine reserve in Africa, I believe. I think it was proclaimed in the 60s. And everything within this boundaries are considered in pristine condition. They've never be, been affected by fishing. Whereas if you look at these 
dot up these um, colored squares outside the boundary, there's heavy fishing effort. So sometimes 10,000 kilograms of this species of fish removed from that area in a given year. So, and also there's uh, this, the sort of thermal patterns between the two areas, highly dynamic, an area of uh, climate change hotspots. Okay. So the idea was to quant to catch individuals from within the reserve and from exploited areas and bring them into a lab and then measure their and quantify their aerobic budgets to see, hey, are the aerobic budget bigger inside reserve for individuals inside a reserve or, or are they not? Was the, the question you were asking. Okay, so this is kind of what you do is you go and catch the fish in the reserve, then you bring them back into the lab and you keep them happy inside these huge tanks. Okay, these fish are quite big, they're like this. And then you have this uh, respirometry setup where you have these experimental tanks and you put this fish inside a, a chamber and you measure its rate of oxygen consumption, which we use as a proxy for its metabolism, because aerobic metabolism consumes oxygen. Yeah. And then while they're in this chamber, we ramp the temperatures up and down and record their metabolic rate as the temperatures change. And then we take them out of the chamber and put them in the swim tunnel, which has got like a propeller and it's increasingly pushing more and more water past it. So they swim more and more and more harder uh, until eventually they get exhausted and they can't swim anymore and they stop swimming. And we measure their oxygen consumption when they eventually give up. And that's their maximum metabolic rate. Okay, so some laboratory experiments. Um, so we're gonna look at the results. So this is for each point is an individual fish. The blue lines are individuals from the protected marine reserve, and the red line are individual red points are individuals from the nearby exploited area. So this is the pattern for basal metabolism, standard metabolic rate with temperature. Okay, fish are ectotherms. As things warm, they need more energy to stay alive. And this is the pattern for maximum metabolic rate. Okay. So when they're maximally exhaust, exhaust, uh, exhausted, that's how much energy they can use. So if you subtract the ones from the other, you get this pattern like this, where you essentially have a greater aerobic scope curve for individuals from within the reserve compared to uh, exploited areas. And we found this was a statistically significant relationship, which is really cool. Um, and so just to sum it up, this, this, to my knowledge, this is the first study to show different physiologies of fish versus unfished populations in the wild. And it provides a physiological mechanism for how MPAs may be able to confer resilience to climate change. So what's the pattern with this is we, there's a link between your physiology, your aerobic scope, your behavior and fishing vulnerability. So generally, if you have a high aerobic scope, you can make use of a lot of oxygen at a given time. Your personality type, if you're a fish, you're generally bolder and more aggressive. Okay. So if you think about how this fishery works, you drop a bait on the bottom, the most aggressive, boldest individuals are being caught out first. So we also call this in the behavior literature, we're fishing populations towards more timbered states, and that has associated physiologies and climate responses. And then, yeah, if you want to read more about that, I'm happy we published this paper in Scientific Reports in 2019. Okay. So that was the first research study. Now I'm moving on to the research study too. Was like, okay, so we found different uh, aerobic scopes in the wild between protected and exploited populations, and it made those nice curves, and we drew some conclusions. But this whole aerobic scope framework was uh, largely theoretical hasn't like its utility at explaining natural ecological patterns was largely based on theory and was wasn't empirically tested so I, I had the idea that if organisms need like a minimum level of aerobic scope to persist aerobic scope is moderated by temperature then aerobic scope and temperature should be able to explain the real world distributions of fish species okay but to do this, I needed a really high resolution and complex ocean model. I was fortunate enough that I was awarded a Commonwealth scholarship during my PhD um, to go and complete it at the University of Southampton in the UK. And that gave me access to the National Oceanographic Centre. And this just happened to be the institute that was producing the most complex next generation level of ocean models for the South African coastline was involved. So I had access to this and I could begin to answer these questions. So I packed up and I moved to the UK 
to finish my PhD. And when I was there, I was able to answer this, uh, ask this research question. Does the aerobic scope explain the contemporary distribution of this fish species that I've been working on? Okay, so the methods are as follows. We've made this aerobic scope curve in the previous research study. Now I've got access to this uh, temperature model from the University of Southampton. And you can see the temperature patterns around this coastline. And then also have access to really high resolution temporal and spatial data for um, catch statistics from the South African catch management system. Okay, so each one of these red points is a catch location from the commercial fishery of the species. And you can't really see it there, but there's like 50,000 points. So this core distribution basically got a head town all the way to the beginning of the trans tower area in South Africa. Okay, so we can use this aerobic scope model to then turn this temperature data into aerobic scope and then make, do some distribution modeling. I did this using random forests where you predict the distribution, the model and learns from itself um, and predicts again and gets more and more accurate over time. And then you test it with a separate data set. Um, and you, I ran a model of like occurrence as a function of aerobic scope plus step plus minimum level of aerobic scope plus maximum aerobic scope spatially. And so these were the results from that. First of all, the graph on the bottom is the output of the distribution model. So yellow is predicted distribution of the species. And you can see an amazing correlation between its occurrence points and where it occurs, where the model predicts it occurs. You can't really see it now, but there's actually a gap over here. And there's quite a few points underneath the African coast here in Durban. And this is actually picked up in the model with this patch of habitat that occurs over there. So it's really accurate at uh, forecasting the distribution of this particular species, aerobic scope that is. There was some overestimation though. If you look at around Cape Town, the temperature model, well, the aerobic scope model predicted a patch of habitat to occur up the west coast where it doesn't actually occur there. But what we found is that if we actually added oxygen as another layer into this model, we found that it improved the accuracy of this distribution model. Okay, because there's, there's a big hypoxic zone there in the Western Cape and there's no oxygen, even though the temperatures are right, no oxygen, you can't aerob use your aerobic metabolism. So this was the first time we started like realizing that it's not just about temperature and aerobic scope, oxygen is also important. Okay, so summaries of this study are that aerobic scope can delimit the distribution of a marine fish, which was awesome. Um, an aerobic scope is a physiological mechanism that perhaps explains why fish occupy a certain thermal envelope. Um, so including, a key thing was that we found including oxygen improves the modeling accuracy. Okay, and this makes sense because when you're measuring aerobic metabolism, you're measuring oxygen consumption. Okay, so if there's no oxygen, you can't consume it. Again, so this is one of the first studies to highlight the need to consider oxygen and temperature interactions in this sort of physiological framework to make robust distribution modeling. And we published this in 2020 in this new conservation physiology journal, which was going around. So I'm very happy about that. Um, but again, the take home message was that we found the mechanism that constrains the distribution, but it's driven by temperature on one side and oxygen on the other. Okay. Research study three. Um, so that was cool. Um, and our, but we to do that, we merged our aerobic scope curves into one sort of master curve. But if you remember from the first study is that um, we found population differences in terms of the aerobic scope curve. Um, so what do these population differences actually explain in the real world? Okay, so aerobic scope is theorized to modulate energy expenditure for activity, but does it in the real world? Okay, so we've got these two populations. They're subject to the same temperature regime. They've got two different aerobic scope temperature relationships. Does that explain anything? We know if we merge them together, we can model the entire distribution, but what is it on a really acute sort of spatial scale? So fortunately, we applied to ASEP and the National Research Foundation at Rhodes University, and we got funding for a large study to answer these questions. And that allowed me to come back to the South African Institute of Aquatic Biodiversity in South Africa and do a postdoc 
Um, and this just to highlight, this was largely done by my MSc student, Mike Skills, and it allowed us to answer this new key research question, which was, does aerobic scope variability among populations explain behavior variability for this fish species in the wild? Okay. So the methods, just to remind you, we've got these two different aerobic scope curves in a protected and exploited area. And then we used acoustic telemetry to try and answer this question. Okay, so how it works is we dropped a bunch of receivers in these. Well, let me just plug this in. We dropped a bunch of acoustic receivers in these two areas that we sampled with the two different uh, aerobic scope curves. And then we caught these fish and we inserted these acoustic transmitters in the insertion and then released them back into the wild. Okay, so what these, these are special transmitters. Not only did they record the location of the fish when it's swimming within this particular array, but it also gave us data on the tail beat frequency so that we could use it as a proxy for the activity level of the fish at the time. Okay, so luckily this fish has a small home range, so they go back and they hang back within this uh, array of receivers, and we can go back and download the receivers and get all this data. Okay, so this is what the temperature profiles of the two areas look like. Just to remind you, blue is protected, red is exploited. You can see extreme thermal variability. Um, upwellings and downwellings. And then we, what we found was a similar pattern to the aerobic scope data is that individuals from the protected area, the blue line, sort of maintain the higher activity level across this whole temperature gradient compared to uh, individuals from the exploited area whose activity levels became curtailed at cold and warm temperatures. So this was pretty interesting again. And a lot of to suggest that aerobic scope does indeed modulate temperature patterns, temperature behavior patterns in the wild. And yeah, basically those two curves kind of looked identical. Well, three years earlier, we caught these fish in a lab and measured this predictor of activity and with temperature, and then later on went and recorded behavior with temperature in the wild. And they kind of matched each other, which is awesome. Um, but again, lots of variability. Um, you'll see in the, in the data point. So why is that? And so again, I think that the oxygen, di oxygen dynamics cause mismatches between temperature, aerobic scope, and behavior relationships. So often there's upwellings and downwellings, and these temperature swings are associated with massive changes in oxygen availability. So maybe the temperature swings to a particular level that's good for the fish, but the oxygen is so low that they're not moving and vice versa. And that's why you get this huge variability in these cases. But again, because we have such a high sample size, we could pull out, pull out a pattern. Um, so this paper is still in prep, but Mike Skills did complete his MSc and was awarded for a with a distinction for it. And now he's in Australia doing his PhD. So we're very proud of that. So that was a build up towards this uh, research study four, which I want to highlight, which is the absolute metabolic index, which I developed. Okay. So clearly from research study two and three, while we did find utility in aerobic scope models, um, both of them suggested that not including oxygen contributes to variance and variability in the data. So what we needed was a unifying aerobic scope model for temperature and oxygen availability. And as I was coming to terms with this, I was fortunate in that I was reached out to by Eric Sperling at Stanford University to go over to America and do a postdoc. And he works in a historical geobiology, geobiology lab, and they look at extinction patterns in deep time. And they're interested in how oxygen and temperature variability drove extinction trends across previous mass extinctions. So he needed an ecophysiologist to, to make a model that he could use. So then I was like, Yo, okay, I couldn't believe my luck. So I went over there and I moved to California. And that allowed, allowed me three years with no questions asked. The only thing I had to do, my, my instructions were do something cool. Um, and so I thought, okay, I'm gonna develop an aerobic scope model that incorporates temperature and oxygen and body size and explains the distribution of life in the ocean. That was the goal. So you can see why it's important here with these uh, figures. So again, your typical aerobic scope model, temperature and aerobic scope, and you have an optimal temperature. 
Now you measure this in the lab, right? And everything in the lab is done at 100% saturation. So if you actually transpose that into the wild, you only have predictive utility for 100% saturation. And as oxygen goes from 100 to zero plus temperatures, your model has zero skill in this whole domain. Yeah, so the majority, it's actually useless in the majority of the ocean. So that's why we needed this. Okay. Okay, so I'll try and explain this. I don't want to... So you got oxygen partial pressure on the x-axis from zero to this point 100, and you've got metabolism on the y-axis. Okay. So you can measure the standard metabolic rate. It's red line. It's quarter at like 1.5. Okay, this is at a single temperature. And you typically measure maximum metabolic rate. Okay. But as oxygen decreases in that experimental chamber, the maximum rate that you can respire actually decreases with oxygen. So it doesn't look like that. It looks like that. Okay. And this point where your maximum rate equals standard metabolic rate. And it's an inflection point before here to crit, the critical oxygen level. Okay. And this is a vital physiological indice. Okay, so it's the minimum amount of oxygen you need to maintain your standard metabolic rate. Okay. So I came up with a model. It's pretty complex, there's models inside of this, but basically it involves PO2 crit and SMR across temperature. And you don't have to think too hard about it. So we call it the absolute metabolic index, but all you need to think about it is it's exactly the same as the previous stuff. Maximum metabolic rate, minus standard metabolic rate, but not just temperature. It also has oxygen because you're measuring PO2 crit. And it's also got mass and how that scales if you do it for a bunch of different masses. Yeah. So I came up with this thing theoretically, and then the idea was to like test its uh, usefulness. So to do this, I was in California, I was working on, I had a shift from fish to purple urchin. Um, so it's exciting, but it's actually a great study organism because they don't die. So you can just pick them up. Um, so the idea was, I need to measure standard metabolic rates, this critical oxygen across the temperature range. And then I could calibrate the parameters of this uh, absolute metabolic index that I think is going to explain this, this missing oxygen level. Okay, so the parameters, if you think of this model like this, okay, you have an output that's yellow, and your parameters you quantify an experiment. So you have S parameters, P crit parameters, um, body size scaling parameters, and then you can put in environmental variables, oxygen level, temperature, body mass, temperature, and body mass again. So you put in your environmental variables, you have the parameters calibrated, and spits out a value. Okay. So I want to test, like, does this have any utility at explaining anything? Is it useful? Okay. So the results are like that. So we're looking at uh, for purple urchin, each purple point is a single data entry, single individual. So you got standard metabolic rate across temperature for a range of different organisms, size wise. And then you've got it's critical oxygen partial pressure across temperature for a range of different size wise. Okay. So that information goes into this model. And then you can predict across temperature and oxygen. Okay. And so these are the results. So I calibrated this thing and you forecast it across temperatures from zero to 35 and oxygen levels from zero to 100% saturation. Okay, yes, yeah, so it's 21. And what you're looking at here is that the yellow area is areas that this model predicts are optimal for purple urchin in the ocean. Okay. If it's yellow, the organism should live there. So then what you can do is you can go into OBIS, which is this database of geo-referenced occurrence points for purple urchin. Okay. So each one of these points has a coordinate. This is where it occurs in this database. You can then layer these points on top of temperature and oxygen levels from an ocean model and you get for each point you get a corresponding temperature and oxygen value and you can stick it onto this aerobic scope frame for oxygen temperature and see does this thing actually explain anything 
And this is when I really started getting excited because when you do that, the results look like that. Okay, so clearly these individuals in the wild are only occupying areas where their um, aerobic metabolic scope is maximized across oxygen and temperature. Yeah, and this model seems to explain that, which is really exciting. Did it for a number of other species as well and also worked, but this is by far the best. Um, so then I took this and I was like, okay, cool, let's map this thing spatially. So where does this uh, model predict this organism to occur in California? And so the purple is aerobic metabolic scope, absolute metabolic index predictions across space at viable habitats. And these black dash lines are the documented northern and southern limits of the species. They're pretty, pretty much nailed at 100%. Um, which was really awesome. So this, we started to think like, okay, this thing actually had some skill at forecasting these changes across the whole oxygen temperature space in the ocean. Um, so yeah, so just to sum it up, coming to the end now, um, I managed to develop an aerobic scope model that includes temperature and oxygen and has predictive utility, it seems to be explaining things. Um, it also explains why organisms prefer cooler temperatures when water lacks oxygen. This is a common pattern. And if you look at the curves, they get colder as oxygen drops. And it also explains why organisms prefer cooler temperatures when they grow bigger. So often you move deeper into cooler water because of the way that this model incorporates the mass scaling. So that was really cool as well. Um, and yeah, it delimits the distribution across the entire ocean space. So that question mark in that model, a hypothetical model that I showed is now filled in, hopefully. I'm happy to say we published this right not that long ago, only like five months ago, for UNICEF in Nature Communications, which is a really prestigious journal, which is awesome. Um, nearly got into the main one, but didn't drop the last hurdle. Um, but yeah, so this was UNICEF is my affiliation for this, and this came out like five months ago. So very happy with that. So I just want to like quickly summarize this overall is that so study one is that I looked at aerobic scope diversity and overall magnitude and found that the overall magnitude is greater in protected versus exploited populations. Then study two found that aerobic scope can predict the distribution of fish. And study three found that aerobic scope can explain the temperature variability among populations. Okay. But both of these um, papers showed me that oxygen creates a lot of noise in the data set. And then finally, we brought it all together by developing this new aerobic scope model that includes both oxygen and temperature. Okay, so hopefully skill at forecasting across the whole ocean space. So we've got this framework. I made, I made this like develop this framework that can be used for any species. Select a species. You measure these two key physiological rates, PO2 crit and SMR, cross temperature. You calibrate this model's parameters. You get temperature and oxygen data from an ocean model. You transform it into this absolute metabolic index. You match the occurrence points. You then can use that to set thresholds in the temperature and oxygen space that can occur. And you can map that distribution spatially and crucially, these ocean models come with forecasts. So now you can predict into the future and you can forecast what is the distribution response of the species likely to be, right? So we did that. And what you can see is a slight movement north of its range. So it's losing a bit of habitat in Baja where there's a hypoxic zone that's expanding. So if you just use temperature, you wouldn't pick that up. Um, so yeah, so we think it's, it's pretty useful. Um, so then I'm very happy with that. And then I've recently, about a year and a half ago, moved across the ocean again, back to the University of Seychelles. And it's time to, to develop this thing even further. And the idea is that now that we have a lot of species that have actually shifted their ranges, we can go back and test the skill of this model to see if it can accurately predict these range shifts that have occurred um, by selecting model organisms. So we're trying to find funding um, with my colleagues in America to start doing this. And the idea would be to select certain species and see if you can hind cast their previous distributions. Um, but also coral reefs and Seychelles are ideal natural laboratories to answer key questions for temperature and oxygen variability. It's not so great for the organisms that inhabit these coral reefs, but coral reefs also, there's 
Oxygen levels swing wildly on coral reefs between the day and the night. Seychelles is an ocean warming hotspot. There's heat waves. And so you can really get into the field and start asking questions. Does the physiology of this species explain why it did this versus that? Um, and so that's where we would like to go in the future. So yeah, basically I need to validate further and improve this uh, ecophysiology model and framework. So thank you for your time. That's all. Um, are opened for questions. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. It's so informative, and you have like your the road that you have taken from the US to South Africa and to this. Ocean spot in the islands, like this, this in general, all this contribution to the science field <laughs> and fisheries. Right? Uh, well, uh, I never touch when it comes to fisheries because I belong to one of the islands, Sri Lanka, Maldives, yeah. and now Seychelles, with yeah. India. Uh, the small thing, uh, the contribution from our area is about $8 billion, including India and the four islands export over $8 billion and about 20 million people depend on fisheries. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking you to uh, your idea and the different uh, fine. So fish catch is an important livelihood and it contributes to the GDP of these islands plus in right? So your findings, like all this respiratory, all this uh, what you call the oxygen levels, the heat, heat transformation and the fish are uh, kind of traveling from one part of the world to that contributes a lot. What do you think uh, when it comes to small islands as well as India and um, the fish, amount of fish, your contribution to that? Like how can you like contribute to increasing the number of fish? Because so many countries are depending on this like so that's yeah. So, so this is like really like the way I see this thing being used. It's a forecasting tool, right? So you can use it to inform adaptive management, so inform management strategy. So perhaps you choose a commercially important species, and you put it through this framework, and you'll model its distribution and forecast where it's likely to go. Okay, so if, then you can be like, okay, this isn't moving predicted to move. So continue as use fisheries management plans, continue as, us as usual, or perhaps you forecast a massive distribution shift, in which case you can tell fishers, okay, you need to get bigger engines, bigger boats. You're going to have to plan to go further. Or if that doesn't work, you must plan to shift species in the future. So it's all about preparing for what will come. It's like how I'd see it being used in like a management sort of framework. Yeah. Yeah. So your license will change to the next species license instead of just one species. And that, especially in South Africa on the West Coast, that was done with the artisanal and citizen fishermen. It's because of the vibration of fish species, because of temperature, they found that the concession areas, we can't change the concession areas, we can change the, the license for species. Okay, Jerome. Um, I am a little bit confused because now I have so oxygen and temperature are mostly different and variables. Yeah. They have kind of linked by the CPT, which you kind of solve by using vast health pressures in order to this inflation. Yeah. Um, but the pressure is also hitting the world for vast health pressure procedure. So when you are organizing, then the next generation should be fixed. I consider that to be not a 
Are you just choosing that ratio of dynamics and fast innovation? So we, we're getting temp, we're getting like oxygen concentration, depth, and uh, temperature, and turning that into partial pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Partial pressure. Yeah. So it's like it flows into a fish across a, across a partial pressure gradient. So it can actually flow like opposite the concentration gradient sometimes. Where are yeah. So that's something that I've like tried to avoid because it's just so complex. Um, and it's I, like. I mean, theoretically, you could find a way to incorporate this all, but from my understanding, in terms of fish, ocean acidification, the like impact on fisheries is, but like hotly debated at the moment. It's more on like calcifying organisms and maybe sea urchins that I actually worked on. But yeah, I haven't considered, I haven't tried to incorporate it yet. Um, I'm just it's daunting. You know, well, say that growth is mass. Mm. Uh, mm. What about uh, recruitment and the Because this is where the fish invest a lot in between their uh, budgets. Yeah. There are seasons during the recruitment where they basically don't think they just fish. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so there's lots, lots of things. Like I'm not considering adaptation. I'm not considering acclimation to these different temperature regimes. So this is more like, I wouldn't say we want, we want to make a prediction of the direction and magnitude. Not necessarily it's going to occur there. It's going to move to like the specific spot. So it's more like looking at trends. Does in the Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And maybe I don't know. I'd be interested to look, look in the data. Perhaps during like a reproductive window, organisms organisms are more sensitive to temperature change because they're using all their energy producing gametes and things like that. Yeah. So there's all these kind of different scales. And yeah. Uh, this is, yeah. So theoretically, you could like measure those temperature standard metabolic rate relationships at like multiple different pHs. And obviously, the higher the standard metabolic rate, the lower the aerobic scope is going to be. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely want to go. Yeah. It's daunting. <laughs> it's daunting, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps something like that. So like you basically what you need is like a holding facility where you can keep these fish alive, like a big broodstock tank, perhaps. And then you need another experimental facility where you've got like lots of tanks. And you can put these rest barometers in and you can like manipulate the temperature quite accurately and manipulate oxygen levels and things like that. Yeah, so it's actually not a lot. Like you needed something like I did it, I built the lab in at Rhodes and like half the space of this. It's a brew stock tank there, an experimental facility there. Yeah, running, going to see water. So that was a mission. Had to buy a tanker and pump water from Kent and bring it to Grahamstown. No, we did it at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but yeah, it definitely is possible. But the main thing, like, there's the equipment you need to measure this metabolism is not cheap. But I might be able to get my hands on some from America. I've just, then my supervisor said he could give me some. I just have to show them that I'm going to use it. 
through the fishery industry as well. It would be not good to do this with tuna, but we could add uh, nutrients. Yeah, and then you've got this other issue of tuna is that, that I control the temperature a bit, so they're like oh, the whole model breaks down. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can definitely target some like that. I think a good thing to be would be like, okay, speak to the fisherman and be like, okay, what has been, what's disappeared, and then you can try and work out like why or how. Yeah, exactly. So the, yeah, the whole thing breaks down. Yeah, it also doesn't have to get like that complex. You can do like simpler ecophysiology studies. Um, we just like yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. yeah, definitely. So, for example, even aquaculture. So, I did this uh, for red abalone, abalone, I say abalone in America. Um, I got the organisms from an aquaculture facility, and we were, we were able to show that the position of the aqu aquaculture facility was in an area that was going to continue to be habitable for um, red urchin. Now, they used that to get a business loan, yeah, because like, there's obviously a lot of risk because the abalone were all dying in California. And so we showed, like, we used that to show they use it. So, okay, well, temperature, oxygen, we find in this one particular spot. Mm. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Good. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming, everyone.